Last week on Bullshift, the podcast, we talked to Liz Mulholland, who is the CEO of Prosper Canada. Liz is a real advocate for ordinary people, um, working class, middle class, and, and lower income Canadians as they try to struggle to make ends meet. We talk about a bunch of things. First off, there is a $60 million commitment in the most recent federal budget. So we talk about what that is, what it means, and what Prosper will be doing with the money. We talk in, in detail about the sorry state of ordinary and middle income Canadians in terms of what they have to struggle with all the time. And I think it might be worth, worthwhile to, to think about that because it'll probably open your eyes about what a lot of your fellow Canadians are going through that you might not be aware of. And we also talk about the role of labeling and the importance that we can um, uh, the, the importance of actually getting people to better understand what they're paying and how much they're paying when they take out loans. So all that and more in this week's Bullshift the Podcast. Welcome to Bullshift the Podcast, the podcast that talks about how the financial services industry shifts your attention to make you feel more bullish. My name is John DeGuy. I am the host of the podcast and the author of the book, Bullshift. My guest this week is Liz Mulholland. Liz is the CEO of Prosper Canada, which is a national charity dedicated to expanding economic opportunity for Canadians living through poverty, through uh, program and policy innovation. Liz, welcome. Thank you, John. It's great to be here. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, the mandate of Prosper Canada, please? Sure. Our mission is to expand economic opportunity for Canadians living in poverty, as you pointed out, and we do that through program and policy innovation. So we're really working with partners in every sector in the ecosystem, financial ecosystem, to look for ways to develop and promote policies, programs, tools, and resources that will measurably improve the financial health of people with low incomes on a large scale. So when you think about the gravity of the situation, and a lot of people listening might not be aware of this, but I've, I've found some info that you were kind enough to help me uh, dig up. Uh, according to Angus, one in three Canadians overall and one in two Canadians with an income of under $50,000 are saying that they are currently in terrible shape or at least bad shape financially. Mm -hmm. And 94% uh, and 80% respectively say it's difficult to feed their house, household. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you a little more or I'll give the listeners a little more background from a general perspective. Two thirds of Canadians have cut back on their discretionary spending. 40% have to draw down on their savings to make ends meet. 35% have to defer making RSP and TFSA contributions. 13% are borrowing from friends and family and 8% have taken out a bank loan just to make ends meet. What would you say to people who are largely unaware, oblivious to these facts with regard to their fellow Canadians? Oh, well, I'd say it's a pretty serious situation out there. Um, uh, and I think it was precipitated by the pandemic and the ensuing you know, inflation and the rise in interest rates. Um, but the problem has actually been building for decades. Uh, we've seen a steady growth in household indebtedness and household debt levels in Canada. Um, it's been going up, 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 up for 30 years. Um, and then we've also seen a decline in household savings. So most Canadians are not saving anywhere near what they should be saving, um, not because they're bad or stupid or lazy or incapable, <laughs> but because uh, there are a lot of structural changes, I think, in the economy, the labor market and stuff that have made it very difficult for them. Um, and and we've seen things like the cost of housing has really risen uh, really severely, which eats up more and more of people's budget. So um, and the other major factors, the change in the labor market is more and more people are not working jobs where they get a steady paycheck every two weeks. Right. And if you don't have steady income, it's very hard to automate your savings and to save successfully. And often people's monthly expenses uh, are, they hit a point every few months where their expenses are higher than their income for that month and they have to borrow um, or draw down on their savings to make ends meet. So it, it's tough, it's tough for households, but uh, all the recent events of the pandemic, inflation, the higher interest rates have really exacerbated that to the point where many households are really struggling right now. So the good news for you and for Prosper Canada is that two or three weeks ago, you got a major shot in the arm 
yeah. in, 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 in the form of a major cash injection from the federal government in the most recent federal budget. Could you maybe walk us through the amount of money, the length of the commitment, and, and what the money is earmarked for? Sure. Uh, it was a very happy moment, uh, not just for Prosper Canada, but for the whole community financial empowerment field in Canada. Um, the, the commitment was for a $60 million investment over five years to our organization to expand free financial help services for people with low and modest incomes across Canada who are struggling right now financially, many of them, but who don't have access to trustworthy and affordable financial help. Um, you know, we've done a lot of work with financial sector partners looking at, you know, the extent of that gap in financial help. And I think there's broad consensus that, uh, you know, low modest income people are not the target market for a lot of financial professional financial help providers, commercial ones. And also that they're actually not super well equipped to help them with the types of financial help that people with low modest income people need. Um, we're thinking about things like year-round tax filing assistance, help navigating government benefit programs, applying for benefits, you know, dealing with unmanageable debt, repairing, you know, damaged credit, um, and helping people access, you know, targeted saving supports for low-income families like the Canada Learning Bond for their children's education or Disability Savings Bond for people with disabilities. So these aren't things that banks and wealth management firms and professional financial advisors typically work on with people. So when you think about the mandate of the book bull shift, but also this mm -hmm. podcast, a lot of what I talk about is optimism bias and the way the financial services industry makes everyone think everything is rosy all the time. And uh, how can we boost profits and what can we do to be financially secure and, and, and so forth. Financial well-being is seldom thought of in terms of the, the flip side, which is sort of running sort of um, a triage for those people that are in a serious uh, situation mm -hmm. that need to be dealt with immediately. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if we could now morph into maybe an example of that, which is high consumer, high cost years. Mm -hmm. That's probably the the uh, the place where a lot of Canadians are turning because they need to, to deal with things based on the things you just shared, you know, the immediacy mm -hmm. of having bills that need to be paid, the, the, the uncertainty of where the next paycheck is going to come from. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about what these high cost lenders are, how they operate and, and they, they fill a role, uh, but um, it's not entirely positive. No, um, certainly not. Um, so these are companies that offer loans and credit at annual interest rates that are over 35% uh, would be how we would describe it. And they're typically they're targeting people who have little or no credit history in Canada, so often newcomers, um, or people who are younger um, and haven't built up a credit score. Uh, people who have impaired credit, so they they run into problems managing their debts um, and their credit obligations. Their credit score is low, and they can't access uh, good mainstream credit that's safer and more affordable. And also people who just don't shop around or read the fine print on loans and financing offers. Uh, so, you know, think somebody who's purchasing a secondhand car or something, or maybe a recreational vehicle or an appliance and their retailer says, oh, we have this financing offer where you only have to pay $112 a month for your brand new fill in the gap. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, and that feels like a very affordable amount to people. So they don't read the fine print and find out that this loan is actually from a company who's charging them 60% annual interest rate um, and has penalties if they repay the amount earlier, et cetera. So they're signing on to something that's forcing, that's going to cause them to pay way more for that consumer good than uh, they need to pay um, and they would have paid had they shopped around a little more and found a more affordable credit option. So there's just, just some examples about. Okay, well, uh, what I was going to say, Liz, and I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll wait for your examples in a moment, but my yeah. observation in listening to you speak is that a, a, a person who is not as charitable as you might uh, refer mm -hmm. to this as usury, that, 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 that what they're charging <laughs> is actually usurious. <laughs> and and um, what a lot of people don't realize is that when you take out loans at such a ridiculously punitively mm -hmm. high rate, you're mm -hmm. doing a great deal of damage to your long-term financial welfare. You're basically borrowing money from your future self, mm -hmm. user's rate. And 
the, 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 the observation that I would have is it seems to me that what we're doing is we're almost institutionalizing poverty for those people who can't get a good leg up to begin with. So once you start down the path of, of payday loans and, and high cost uh, borrowing, it's mm -hmm. very difficult to get off that treadmill. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And we see it all the time. You know, our community partners who are delivering free financial help now uh, serve tens of thousands of people a year. And they see over and over and over again, people who have taken out an installment loan, a payday loan, uh, one of these, you know, financing offers at a retailer and only afterwards realize what they were paying. Um, and it, it, it inevitably it's plunging a lot of them into a debt spiral where they can't afford to pay the loan. They stop paying other bills in order to keep up with the loan payment that damages their credit further. They take out an, a second payday loan to pay off the first payday loan. I mean, up to a point where uh, one of our partners saw somebody who had 34 outstanding payday loans. Uh, so an initial loan of three or $400 can balloon into a loan of tens of thousands of dollars in under two years. So um, it's a very slippery slope. Um, and it's why we call it not only high cost, but high risk, this kind of lending. So, um, so and you know, technically, uh, most of these loans are under the criminal rate of interest cap uh, because payday loans are exempted currently, um, and the cap is at 60%. But um, the, happily, the federal government is looking at lowering that criminal rate of interest, so um, so people will be paying less. Um, but still, even at 35%, that's a hefty interest rate. So, you know... <laughs> It's uh, it's still something that our consumers have to really be thinking more comprehensively, not just what is my monthly payment, but what is the annual percentage rate? Is there a better uh, source of credit available? Do I really need this right now? Should I be saving instead uh, and, and delaying my purchase? Um, or could I borrow from friends or family if it's urgent? Um, and, and, and just being more prudent at what they take on and understanding uh, also, uh, what you see commonly is a lot of extra junk fees and charges loaded onto these products. Mm -hmm. uh, things like the the penalty for early repayment, um, pretty bad in loan insurance that really nobody's ever going to be able to really make use of, but they're paying for every month. Um, and then all sorts of administrative and junk fees that really don't bring any value to the consumer, but are just tacked on after the fact and they often find out about later. So, um, and, and consumers really don't have a line of sight on all of these things. It's, you know, it's buried in a contract, it's in nine point font, uh, nobody tells them, the, the retailer is eager to make a sale and just emphasizes over and over again, you hear people saying, well, it was a low monthly payment. I thought I could afford it. It sounded great. You know, I could get the yeah. car of my dreams, you know. <laughs> I could uh, take so, so maybe that car of my dreams is part yeah. of the problem. I'm gonna come back to that in a moment, but it's funny yeah. how I'm, I'm sort of showing my age. Mm -hmm. uh, in graduate school, I did some work for what was then called Consumer and Corporate Affairs, a now defunct yeah. federal department. And we were looking at credit card rates and we were all aghast at credit card rates that approached 20%. Mm -hmm. And we thought that was ridiculous. And I still think it is for, for what it's worth. Mm -hmm. But now we're talking about what a great policy win it would be if we can get um, uh, payday loans from 60% down to 35%. Yeah. Uh, you know, that is a huge yeah. victory. But it's, it's still outrageous <laughs> and it's still almost double what we thought was what I thought was yeah. ridiculous 30 years yeah. ago, 40 years ago. Yeah. So it's, it's just uh, we have a long, long way to go. Could I ask you to comment? You said off the top that these are not bad people. These are just people that for whatever reason, some of them are new to the country. Some of them are falling mm -hmm. on tough times, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, the, that they need these 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 loans in order to, to get by. There are some, I'm wondering if you can comment on a few who perhaps buy this car of their dreams when they don't necessarily even need a car. They could carpool mm -hmm. or they could use public transit or what have you. Yeah, and don't get me wrong, I don't think we need all these loan products. And I think a lot of times people do have better options, not always, but you know, Acorn Canada is a national association of people with low incomes. They have over 10,000 members and they survey their members regularly. And when 
when they asked them, you know, if you knew you were paying this much, would you still borrow the money? And the answer that came back was a lot of them said, well, no, I would put off making the purchase or I would look to see if I could borrow from friends or family instead, or I would look for a lower cost form of credit. Um, but what we hear, particularly for low income, is many of the neighborhoods that people live in, if they're in an urban area, uh, the mainstream banks and credit unions have pulled out of those neighborhoods. Um, and the high cost lenders and check cashers, et cetera, have moved in. So the fringe financial services. And what people like about those services is that they're convenient, they're fast, they have money, they can get money in their hand in under an hour if they desperately need it. Um, and also they've often heard, we've often heard from people saying, you know, when I go into a mainstream bank, I don't get treated very well because, you know, my clothes are not nice. You know, I may be sleeping on the street. Um, I may have a disability and people don't want to serve me because it takes me longer to communicate, et cetera. But when I walk into that money mart or the check cash or the payday lender in my neighborhood, they always greet me by name. They're very polite. They're respectful. I get good service. They follow up, you know, and uh, and often in ways they're a little bit creepy. We heard one person said that they got a handwritten note from their payday lender. From, let's call her Susan, who works there. Mm -hmm. Uh, saying, you know, Maria, I know Christmas is coming up and you're really going to want to do right by your kids and make them really feel special this Christmas. Why don't you drop by and we'll see what we can do to set you up? You know, like, so they're, they're, they're wooing people with blandishments and by making them feel well treated for once in their life, you know, and they do a way better job than mainstream financial services do. So it sounds like what you're describing is a form of optimism bias. Uh, yeah. Optimism when you think bad things will happen but they're not going to happen yeah. to me i think a lot of people that are using payday loans are saying uh good things are going to happen to me at some point uh they, they mm -hmm. it's just around the corner i'm going to get my good break and things are going mm -hmm. to be fine could you expand on the idea of optimism bias as it pertains to the the people you see at prosper canada sure i think you know we're all hopeful you know to a certain degree and particularly when times are tough and and I think in the way that these high cost loans are marketed to people, often emphasizing that low monthly rate and that that low monthly rate is only possible because they extend the term of the loan for years and years and years, not payday loans, but the, the other loans um, and they're charging a high interest rate. So um, so people, all they hear is that's affordable to me and it makes people feel great. Like, ugh, things are looking up. I can afford now that thing that I really want or need. And, and and they are confident that that low rate means they can pay it off. What they don't realize is they're paying the cost of that consumer good two or three times over uh, because of the excess interest that they're paying. But so, you know, in, in other cases, we've seen, you know, car dealers that uh, secondhand car dealers in some cases will say to somebody, well, we can get you financing but because their credit score is not great, the, the interest cost is very high on the financing, the loan. But they say to them, you know, if you work hard to repair your credit um, in this year, you can go back in a year and the bank will give you a lower interest rate. They're lying, actually. Um, but people believe, oh, I can do that. I can apply myself. But sure, I can improve my credit score. And great, you know, this will be a cheaper loan next year and I'm going to make progress. So, so people, they do want to believe. You know, <laughs> their life will get better. And it's easy when somebody is responding to your desires and telling you that you can do better, it's easy to believe them. You know, we all want to believe in our, that our life is going to improve. It's funny because a lot of what I write about and talk about and the people that I speak to, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm questioning the, the optimism bias of the people who think they can get an extra one or 2% on their return and mm -hmm. and and thinking that there's optimism in terms of a, a positive outcome mm -hmm. but this is more in terms of optimism of a negative outcome that's foregone or averted yeah and, yeah and that yeah. you know that you know i'm, I'm going to be able to not i'm not going to be one of those people who ends up on the street i'm going to be able to yeah. keep my my rental property my, my the, the place where i'm yeah. paying my rent yeah. and, and continue to do yeah. these things so optimism bias is a problem and it it occurs it seems to me across the entire spectrum 
you know, from the very, but we're all wired to, that way. <laughs> we're, yeah, we're all wired that way. Yeah, and and yeah. It's, it's dangerous. Yeah. And, and again, I'm, I, I always tell people that I'm not opposed to optimism. I'm opposed to optimism bias. I, you know, be mm -hmm. realistic. Yeah. What can we do to level the playing field so that those people who are hardworking, who have good intentions and who mm -hmm. honestly believe they can make ends meet and mm -hmm. can turn the corner and, mm -hmm. and, Perhaps they're right if it weren't for the hand they've been dealt in terms of the 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 high rates they have to pay and the, the long mm -hmm. terms that they have to keep on paying them. What can we mm -hmm. do to help those people actually be contributing members of society the way they want to be? I'm not, I don't want to say they're not yeah, going to no, be no, rock, rock straws, yeah. but they're going to yeah. be people who can fit in. Yeah. And, and the reality is that people's low incomes are actually, you know, surveys have shown this much better at budgeting, managing their money than many people with more money are because they can't afford to make mistakes um, and they can be quite cautious. But I think what we've got is an uneven playing field in terms of information asymmetry here. <laughs> the consumer doesn't stand a chance when they're not the, the core information they need to make an informed decision is not presented clearly and transparently to them. So you know, the lenders are kind of not showing them the information or downplaying or featuring the information that they know will trigger that optimism, but downplaying the information that would trigger the warning bells. Um, so one way to level the playing field is to require standardized labeling and disclosure for all types of credit products. Um, and it should clearly capture the true annual percentage rate of interest all other associated fees and charges and the total cost of the loan as well as the term of the loan. So they understand in dollar terms, this is going to cost me this much to borrow this money. Um, uh, and this is the interest rate I'm paying. Um, and a great example of where this has been done is the Mission Asset Fund is a nonprofit in San Francisco, and they created a standardized financial facts label for all the credit products available to low-income people in there community and they modeled it on the nutrition facts label that we see on food products in the grocery store mm -hmm. which everybody mm -hmm. can understand you can scan it in five seconds you can take in the key information and it's standardized information so um it means that everybody uh you can compare you can pick up two products on the grocery shelf and say which cereal has less sugar or less fat in the same way you can compare credit products with this labeling and in fact in the states the um, uh, the Federal Communications Commission, which regulates all their telecom and internet, uh, has just required standard uh, consumer broadband labels modeled on that nutrition facts label for every single internet service in the United States. Now it has to have the same labeling, the same clear information. So in Canada, it would be great if we could have the provincial regulators come together with the federal one and agree that we're going to require that kind of labeling on all our credit products. And then once you have standardized labeling and data on these things, then consumer groups like mine or a regulator can build an online tool where people can scan the data, all the different products available, check the features that are most important to them and see which ones best meet their needs. And we have great examples of that on the Financial Consumer Agency of Canada's website where they have an online bank account selector tool and a credit card selector tool already. Yeah. So why can't we do that for other types of credit products? Yeah, great. Well, I, I've already had uh, someone from FCAC on the podcast, so we've talked about that. <laughs> so that's, it, it's interesting because you use food labeling as an example. And the thing that I've used in the past in talking about um, radical disclosure mm -hmm. is what has happened in the past 30 or 40 years with regard to cigarettes. Yeah. And, and it's at the point now where it's not just a disclosure, it's right on the packaging. You cannot possibly miss it. And yeah. it comes with really stark imagery that makes yeah. things really, really um, jarring. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if we did something like that with regard to the loans that, that, that people mm -hmm. are taking out in terms of, you know, this is not just a $1,000 loan, but if you pay it out over the next 10 years, it's a 10 year mm -hmm. loan, it'll, it'll work mm -hmm. out to $2,782 and 18 cents. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Similarly, that, that, that's a different yeah. conversation and it's the same yeah. facts. It's, it's just yeah. presented in a way that becomes salient for the people yeah. that are using exactly. the service. Yeah. And, the headline on the label where you're going to yeah. pay $2,433 
for the loan of this money, uh, which is only a thousand dollars, you're gonna you're gonna think twice. You know, it's almost as though what you would have is an on online calculator that you could say, okay, I want to sign up for this one thousand dollar loan, and you you plug in mm -hmm. the interest rate in the term, and you push mm -hmm. a button, and it spits out something mm -hmm. that says, this is how much I will be paying over the duration of the loan. Mm -hmm. You've mm -hmm. got to sign that. It would be great if we could actually get people to force mm -hmm. force the people that offer these loans to get mm -hmm. their their customers, their clients to sign something that explicitly states that before the entire loan is paid off, it'll be almost three times as much as the amount of money they borrowed in yeah. the first place. That, yeah. that might cause a lot of people to reflect. And at least they can't, at least then the people who use the, the service can't say, well, yeah. I didn't know. Because uh, what I'm yeah. hearing you say, Liz, is a lot of people honestly don't know. Yeah, they don't know. Um, and we see it. I was talking to a lender who offers a product that consolidates um, high cost loans for people, but at a much lower rate. And he said they analyzed who was using their products and it turned out to be middle income people and often to purchase recreational vehicles. Um, but he said when we talked to them, they had no idea they were paying 60% interest on this money, you know, to buy their ATV or their e-bike or whatever it was. Um, and these are- and, and, and that's a problem for me. I, I, I have to admit when I hear that, I get frustrated because these are decent, normal middle-class people who really ought to know better. And I'm, I'm actually angry that they don't do enough um, it's almost like they're willfully ignorant. Like they almost don't want to know because yeah. they really want to get to that TV. So they don't ask the tough questions uh, that a person who, you know. Yeah, I, and we've happened. all been guilty of impulse purchasing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's just enough. a sweater and not an ATV. But, um, but you know, and I don't. we've all met great salespeople, you know, yeah. who understand how to punch our buttons and, uh, and sell us the dream. And, um, so I think you're right. We have to build in, you know, these these moments <laughs> of truth and clarity for people in the transaction process so that it becomes super clear to them what they're signing on for. And the the dreamy haze is lifted for a moment and the stark reality is facing them squarely in the face. Um, and there are different ways to do that. And I think we should be experimenting and trying more of them because, um, yeah, it's too many people are making decisions that they live to regret later. And um, and, and, and they're life destroying decisions in some case when debt balloons, sure. um, it, it robs people of opportunity. It robs them of their mental health and their well being. Um, and in some cases it gets even worse. So um, okay. I think that's, that's yeah. clear. Let's, let's see if we can turn the corner to one other element of the budget from a couple of weeks ago. Sure. A couple oh. of weeks ago, there was a um, uh, mm -hmm. the, the federal budget talked about a, a change in the capital gains inclusion rate for people that are um, uh, private corporations and people who are individual citizens mm -hmm. who sell things that have gone up by a lot. Mm -hmm. And I think of that and I compare that policy announcement with the funding announcement for Prosper Canada. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you could have any message to the people that are complaining about the capital gains inclusion rate from the chair that you sit in as the CEO yeah. of Prosper Canada, what would you tell those people? Um, you know, <laughs> I think good and smart people can disagree on the merits of the increasing the capital gains tax as a way to achieve tax fairness, because fairness like beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Um, and any tax analyst will tell you there are many ways to analyze tax fairness, but I think we need to look beyond this just one measure and think about what is the problem the government was trying to solve here. And, and that problem is growing wealth inequality in Canada, which really threatens to undermine the quality of life and the well-being of Canadians writ large, you know, and really to fundamentally change our society for the worse. And anybody who's traveled and has been to countries that have a high degree of inequality understands what it looks like. And it's not a society that I think most of us want to live in, including the 1%, you know, like, um, okay. so. It, uh, that's all I wanted. I just yeah. wanted to get a, a, get your impression very quickly. Yeah. We have to wrap up. So let's move on okay. to the way we always like to finish things. And that is okay. with uh, the first of two, which is that's bullshit. If it was up to Liz Mulholland, what would you change in the way we do finance in Canada? Uh, um, these uh, deals between retailers with a high cost lender to offer point of sale financing at really high rates drive me bananas. 
uh, because I think when somebody's at the cash register, their child is screaming, they want to seal the deal, you know, they will sign on. They're not in a frame of mind to make a considered decision or just shop around and compare their financing options. But they're buying things like household appliances, computers, home office equipment, whatever it is. Um, and they end up paying through the notes. So that is one thing that I would want to tackle. Um, okay, so then how would you tackle it? So let's move on then to yeah. shift happens. You've, you've now identified yeah. uh, what you'd want to, what the problem is. How would you fix it? Um, so it's a little along the lines that you were suggesting, John, uh, that uh, FCAC would work with the provincial regulators and they would agree to adopt uniform strict disclosure requirements across the country that require retailers for offering this kind of point of sale financing. Uh, to verbally advise the consumer and in writing. So hand them the contract, but verbally walk them through the annual percentage rate of interest on that financing off offer, how long the term is, whether or not they get a penalty if they repay it early, and the total dollar amount of interest they're gonna be paying on that purchase. Um, and any other fees, charges, and penalties that apply. And only then are they allowed to conclude the sale. Um, and then the, you would absolutely need to put in place mystery shoppers to enforce, uh, to make sure that retailers were doing Super. what they need to do. Great, thank you, Liz. This has been a wonderful conversation and I'm very appreciative of the work that you and the good people at Prosper Canada do to, to help people who need help. So thank you so much for, for all you do and for being on the podcast this week. Thank you, John, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. John DeGuey is a portfolio manager in Toronto and the author of the book, Bullshift, How Optimism Bias Threatens Your Finances. Bullshift is available online and in bookstores everywhere. The opinions expressed in this podcast should not be construed as investment advice. Bullshift, the podcast, is produced by TalkShoe, a division of IOTUM.